Okay, we're up, we're ready, we're going. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Neil Kalin. I'm joined with, by Ashley Peterson and our guest today is Jean Grove, who's gonna be chiming in and we're gonna be talking about her and her practice and her life and all sorts of stuff a little bit later. This is January, what's up with us? The real property law section of the California Lawyers Association, where we try to keep you up to date on some things that, that we think are relevant that you should know about cases and statutes and the like, as well as what's going on with the real property law section and our various activities. Let's see if I can change my slide. Here we go, so here's our agenda. To this, so we'll first so welcome back Ashley. She missed last month. She was on one of her many vacations. <laughs> I might be to, to just like a guest host for now on because I never know when you're going to be in town or you're going to be gallivanting around the world somewhere. So welcome back, Ashley. Good, Good to be back, you. Neil. I missed you. <laughs> Thank you. I missed you too. Um, we got um, three k. We got three cases today and the statute, and you could see them right there. By the way, somebody had asked before we started our program if they could get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And certainly you can if you are interested. Um, and I guess in the chat, you could chat to the, the, the real property woo-woo there and say you'd like a copy of the presentation. We will turn it into a PDF and and our real property section coordinator will send it out to you after the fact, after we're all done with today. So yes, glad we had that question and we're always happy to help out. So as I say, we're gonna discuss these few cases, we're gonna have our interview and mostly what we're gonna talk about in our, I'm talking about the RPLS update and activities. I'm really gonna turn it all over to Ashley at that point and we're gonna see what's going on. So let's go into, Ah, what are we doing today? We figured out as we're reading through these cases, we actually kind of have a theme today. And the theme is our family feud edition. We've got an ex-wife versus her ex-daughter-in-law. We have a parent versus a child and a grandchild. And the statute talks about decedents versus decedents. So that's our, that's our kind of our theme today. We don't always have a theme in our what's up presentations, but today we do. And talking about the family theme, hey, guess what? Ashley, while she was away, she got herself engaged. Yeah. Oh, you won't find yourself in any of these problems, Ashley. You know, we just, uh, you know, uh, I've been married for 28 years. So hopefully you'll find a long and happy life together with your fiance. And I guess, I don't know, soon to be husband. I don't know how long your engagement is for. But thanks, Neil. Congratulations, Ashley. Yeah, yeah, we're very excited. The wedding's going to be next uh, next April in 2023 in Montana, because you know how much I love Montana. So. I do, I do. So where where did the proposal take place, Ashley? In Maui. We were in Hawaii over New Year's, and it was actually on New Year's Eve. So it was very unexpected and really uh, wonderful, and uh, we're so excited. Well, good, and that's going to be very memorable. Yes. And unex unexpected, huh? Okay, so we'll have we'll talk about that more offline, Ashley. But anyways, we want to make sure our whole woo-woo family is aware <laughs> of your engagement and we want to wish you the best of luck with your marriage. Only unexpected as the timing. It was not unexpected that it was going to happen. Just just this. Ah. On, on this trip, it was unexpected. <laughs> okay, well, then yeah. that's great. That's great. On New Year's Eve, that's really perfect. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So let's jump right in. We'll talk about our first case, Kumar versus Ramsey. Um, Ashley and I, those of you who are on a little bit earlier, were saying, oh my God, this case is really kind of a complicated case. So I decided to try to simplify it a little bit. You did, you did a good job, Neil. You did a good job. Yeah, okay, glad, glad to hear you say that, Ashley. So let's just talk a little bit about the backstory, right? So in October of 2004, you have Walker who sells a South Lake Tahoe property to the coast. All right, no big deal so far. Deed was recorded, you know, a couple months later. I don't know, I took too long, two months to record the deed. Deed was recorded a couple months later. Um, afterwards, 
there was recorded another document that was reserving, and those of you who know Lake Tahoe area will know more about this than I do, but reserving 23,180 square feet of land coverage rights, which apparently gives somebody in the Lake Tahoe area the right to build or the right to improve upon their property subject to a particular planning agency in Tahoe. Okay, so Walker sold to Co, but Walker was reserving, right? So um, 23, a certain amount of the land coverage. But Walker also gave Co the right to buy back 3,000 square feet of those rights. Okay, so far so good. Got a buyer and a seller. They agreed that the seller would reserve some rights. The buyer would have the right to purchase them at a later point in time. The buyer has an option. All right, no problem. Now the buyer co sells the property to a third party, Lewis, a couple of years later. After that purchase, what happens then? Well, co records a document saying, hey, I exercised my right back in 2005 to purchase at 3,000 square feet of land coverage rights. Okay, again, the, the timing of the filing, a little bit strange, but that's not an issue here. Now, actually, when I was looking at this, I was thinking, you know, sometimes in real property, you have the doctrine of merger, right? So co- at that point in time, in 2005, owned the property, reacquired these land coverage rights. So is there the possibility, and we'll talk more about this later maybe, that maybe those land coverage rights merged into her ownership? I don't know. I didn't see a discussion about that in the case, but it certainly raised you know, some issues with me. They also did question like how the option was to be exercised, you know? So I thought that I, there was also not really a lot of talk about the option. Right, right. It was just kind of taken for granted for the purpose of this case. All right, so what happens after that? Lewis, a couple of years later, loses the property through foreclosure. Kumar, who is the plaintiff in this case, well, acquires the property from the lender. So after foreclosure. When Kumar acquired the property, the title search did reveal that there was these land coverage right documents that were recorded. So at least there was some kind of notice of these land coverage rights. After Kumar acquired the property for like a couple year period, he was sending letters to Co, to the predecessors, to the Lake Tahoe Planning Agency, stating that, hey, wait a minute, I have these land coverage rights, or at least I have whatever was left you know, at the time of Walker's acquisition of the property. All right, great. So what happens later on? Co winds up transferring, this is several years later, transfers 360 feet of these square feet of these rights to Ramsey. The Tahoe agency approved the transfer of those land coverage rights to Ramsey and Kumar brings suit. Now we're already in 2018. Kumar brings suit to say, ah, wait a minute, you know, you don't, you never had the right to acquire those rights. Ramsey brings a motion to dismiss and to seek sanctions, saying, you know, this is outrageous. This is so long after you acquired the property. No reasonable attorney would have ever brought this case. You know, this case should be dismissed. And the case was dismissed, but for the purpose of the appeal, we're only talking about the sanctions. And what did the trial court say? The trial court said, well, the time to have brought the action for a quiet title action is four years. That began either at the date when the property was first acquired in, 20, in 2008, or at the latest when, when Kumar started sending these letters in 2009. Well, we're well past that in 2018, you know, when the lawsuit got brought. So guess what? Ramsey, you know, gets her dismissal and gets $29,000 in sanctions awarded. Kumar appeals and Ashley, what happened in the appeal? 
Oh, go off. All right. Sorry, sorry. I was trying to avoid any uh, microphone back feeding there. Um, yeah. yeah, so in the appellate, the appellate court disagreed with the trial court overall, and they basically said that uh, the sanctions were not really uh, appropriate in this particular case because they didn't think that the claim was objectively unreasonable um, or frivolous. They believe that there was a basis for uh, Kumar to bring this case. Um, and the outstanding adverse claim was a continuing cause of action until a hostile claim was asserted. So um, when he's no longer in undisturbed possession. So basically they said the trial court was wrong by saying that the, the date of purchase was when the four-year statute of limitations commenced. And uh, it would have been when he uh, was no longer in possession of the property that that's when it would have started. So that would have allowed him to bring it within the four-year period. Um, and a reasonable attorney could fairly argue that until sale to Ramsey, Kumar's possession was never actually disturbed. So they uh, overturned the sanction award and uh, they denied Ramsey uh, additional attorney fees for frivolous appeal. All right. So, so even though there's those recordings, the appellate court said, ah, it doesn't really, doesn't really mean much because nobody was asserting any rights uh, against Kumar until there was the actual transfer by Co to Ramsey. And mm -hmm. that's, that could have, a reasonable attorney could have said, that's the proper point that triggers the cause of action. Okay. All right, so is there anything here that maybe surprised you or, or uh, anything that you think is interesting, Jean? You know, <laughs> as, you're, as you're kind of looking the other way, I'm surprising you here. Um, my only note is that ultimately the, the underlying decision was not disturbed on appeal. This really is a, a question about whether sanctions should be awarded. And it looks like they gave the attorney the benefit of the doubt, even if ultimately that attorney was wrong to pursue the case in 2018. That was my take. Yeah, because it looked like the appeal only had to do with the sanctions issue and not with the underlying dismissal. Right, right. right. Yeah, I mean, it seems like from my to discussions with fellow litigate, which I'm not a litigator, but discussion with litigators is that sanctions are, are pretty difficult to actually get, you know, if, if for frivolous claims and things like that. So it was a little surprising. The trial court did seem to find that as a grounds to award the sanctions. So, you know, you say that and in our, our third section, there's the appellate decision. The appellate decision, I as I was reading this, I'm like, it was citing to this case, Peak versus Underwood. I'm like, Peak versus Underwood, why does that mean something to me? And I realized why it meant something to me is that I wrote the amicus brief for the California Association of Realtors in that case, where we were saying sanctions should have been awarded against an attorney who filed a claim against a real estate broker for a latent defect that nobody could have seen. <laughs> so, um, like I say, it's hard to get them. Uh, we actually you know, we weren't the party to that case. We just write as a, as a friend of the court. But uh, anyone who wants to see a case where sanctions were awarded, you can go to Peak versus Underwood. That's Sorry. pretty cool, Neil, I have to say. <laughs> hey, I get to be involved in some cool ones. They all don't come out our way. That's, <laughs> that's kind just, of the beauty of the appellate court. You're kind of a big deal, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's what I like about appellate cases that the easy cases don't get appealed, only the hard cases get appealed. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's see what else we got. Ah, here, now we're starting our family feud division of what's up with us. And we're gonna start with the case of McMillan versus Air, decided in September of last year. And we'll briefly go through the facts here. 2007, Josh, who is the plaintiff's son here, marries Son. Okay, so son and a daughter. 2010, the mother, so this is right after, right, right after the Great Recession in California. So 2010, the mom, Sharon, purchases property one. And then a couple of months later, gives the deed to her son with the verbal instructions, hold on to this deed until you either get the money to buy the property from me or I die. Okay, verbal instruction, nothing written on the deed, no conditions on the deed whatsoever. Just a straight grantee. 
Few months later, the mom buys another property, property number two. She could not get financing, so she bought it with a seller carry back, purchased it in the name of the trust. Mother was uh, both the trustee and the beneficiary. The trust then transfers to the mom, who transfers to her daughter, not her daughter-in-law, to her daughter. The point was that what they were trying to do was they're hoping that the daughter had better credit and the daughter would be able to refinance to get rid of that seller carry back on the loan. The daughter later transferred to the son, Josh, okay? Um, and the daughter, and some kind of weird kind of thing, the daughter also later transferred to a second trust. So again, another issue with recordings, people probably not knowing exactly what they're doing, you know, doing run deed at one time, another deed at another time. But that didn't seem to be too much of an issue in this case. So now the son has deeds to both property one and property two, keeps them both in a safe deposit box, the son and the daughter happened to live in property number two. There was the same verbal condition with property number two that there was with property number one. Hold on to the deed until you get the money to buy the property from me, the mother, or when I die, then you can record the deed. As it turns out with property number one, the mother took out a home equity line of credit, $250,000, okay? Um, and the money, it looks like somehow went to the son. It was kind of hard to figure out exactly what was going on with that, but that's a lot of money, you know, a quarter of a million dollars, okay? There was some allegation that the son and the daughter-in-law were paying that back, but they were living in the property and there was no indication that they were paying rent for living in the property. So maybe that was the cost of them living in the property, who knows? Here's the best fact of this case. October 26, 2013, the daughter-in-law, right, had previously gone into the safe deposit box, takes out the deed and records both of them. Lo and behold, six days later, she files for divorce. She files for divorce after the deeds to both properties were recorded and claims both property one and property two as community property, and she's entitled to her half interest, I suppose, in community property. The mother learns about this files a complaint against the daughter-in-law for constructive trust, said, you were basically acting as my fiduciary, okay, and asked the court to cancel the deeds. That, that, that the deeds were held in trust for the mother-in-law, basically. What did the trial court say? The trial court said, well, a constructive trust is a remedy, okay? The constructive remedy is a claim, is effectively a claim for breach of fiduciary duty, a daughter-in-law owes a fiduciary duty to her mother-in-law. Okay. That was appealed. The appellate court made a number of findings. First finding, kind of a technical finding, said, trial court, you had no right as part of your order to say that the constructive trust remedy is a claim for fiduciary duty. You just can't do that as a court without giving the other party an opportunity to respond. You just can't make that up as part of your order, as part of your decision. The appellate court also says, you know, there is no fiduciary duty. There is no automatic fiduciary duty from a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law, okay? And the only agreements were between the mother and her son. That's where the verbal agreements lie. The mother gave the deed to the son with the promise that the son would not record until one of those two events happened, okay? So the daughter-in-law never agreed. The daughter-in-law never was put in a position of trust with respect to the mother-in-law. And then third point, the appellate court said, you know, kind of regardless, okay, verbal agreements to hold a deed by a grantee are just not enforceable. Why? Well, because there's a California Civil Code on the issue, Civil Code 1056, a grant cannot be delivered to the grantee conditionally. You know, it's kind of a discussion about this, which is, you know, what's, what's the point of that Civil Code provision? And the court was saying the point of that Civil Code provision is to prevent fraud. And they said, this is a good case of why that Civil Code provision was there. When the mother 
gave the deed to the son, the hope was the son could use that deed to refinance the property that he did not even really own. So they wanted it both ways. They want the ability to get the refinance, but without putting title into the son's name. So I thought that was kind of an interesting case. Ashley, what do you think about this case? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this question about the deeds and stuff happens all the time in my practice. I mean, you know, you, you pull a property profile to see what transfers have gone on on these properties and you see all these deeds back and forth between family members, you know, it's like you literally have to write out, you know, your list of the transfers and who did what and who had what percentage. And I can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh, actually this person still owned, you know, 25% of the property, which was never transferred. Um, you know, and then you still have to go through probate for that one. So it's, um, it's very common where people will just do these transfers and they don't really know the full ramifications legally of what it means with these deeds being recorded or even just signing a deed and handing it to someone because that, as the court was saying in this case, is sufficient to transfer title. It doesn't have to be recorded as long as it's signed and handed over. So, so you, you see a lot of this in, and is what you're saying is you think a lot of it has to do just with a, a layman's lack of understanding or do you think a lot of this is done because people are trying to game the system in one way or the other? I think it can be both. I've seen it both ways. I mean, obviously some of it is, you know, trying to get around paying off a mortgage lender and, you know, trying to transfer title and not letting the mortgage lender know. And of course I tell them, hey, that's lender fraud. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm or... glad you're telling that, Ashley. Very good. Very good. <laughs> you pass ethics course, 101. Yeah. Uh, or, or they just, you know, they don't understand the difference between being on title versus equity ownership versus community property rights that, you know, I just think there's a lot of confusion that lay people have regarding the legalities of, of title ownership and property deeds. Okay, good. Thank, and, and you see more of this than I do in my practice. I'm kind of a behind the desk kind of a person. Jean, I see you're actually looking towards us this time. So I'm not catching you by surprise. Uh, do you have any input here or any commentary? No worries. I have two monitors, so I'm reading on <laughs> one and then looking at you at another. So I'm curious, I did not read this case in its entirety. Was the result then that those deeds were in fact enforceable and then subject to community property? That was the result? There was, there was another element of this case where the, the, uh, the appellate decision said, since there was a, I guess, a divorce proceeding going on, the trial court had no right to determine community property interest. Mm -hmm. And so really, whether the community property, whether the, these two properties are in fact community property is going to go to the, the, the divorce proceeding, okay? Sure. The, the judge who had jurisdiction over the divorce proceeding I would think if they look at this case, McMillan versus Ear, the court's going to say, hey, these are community property. That, that's right. what I would think is ultimately going to be the outcome. Of. Right. Yeah, that's what I would think. I mean, they would definitely bring that up as a new petition, probably in the family court case once this case decision came out. Makes sense. Okay, well, that's good. So that that's the first part of our family feud, right? So we got... We got the mother versus the daughter-in-law, but we're going to take a little break from family fighting and we're going to go to our interview. We've already heard from Jean a couple of times. So let me introduce to you Jean Grove. And Jean is a, she's the managing partner of the Sonoma office. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just reading a comment um, of the Sonoma office of, and let me see if I could pronounce the name right. Hoffman, Dalowich, and Volek. Did I say that right, Jean? That's right. Very okay. good. <laughs> that's great. And that firm, at least from what was on the website that I think you mentioned a little bit different when we spoke, um, has 15 offices nationwide with 180 lawyers. And it says right there on the screen, you're co-chair of the real estate practice group. So um, your practice involves consulting, transactional work, and litigation. I don't know which one of those 
takes up most of your time. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice? Well, to answer that question, litigation always takes most of my time. The <laughs> transactional clients tend to be, not always, but they, they tend to be a little more relaxed because they're in a cooperative environment. Um, but we do have a pretty robust transactional department that handles CCNRs, TIC agreements, all sorts of land use questions, permitting, that sort of thing. Litigation usually focuses around buyer-seller disputes, HOA matters, co-ownerships. I know you're gonna talk about partitions in a little bit. I do a lot of those type of cases, which is actually also in the theme of the family feud right, often right. Um, when we're dealing with, with family members and a piece of property. So that's basically my career in a nutshell. So Jean, you weren't always in Sonoma. You started in San Francisco, is that correct? That's right. So tell us a little bit about how you made that shift. When did you make the move? Were you with your current firm when you made the move? What happened there? Well, I did start in San Francisco and practice there doing largely landlord-tenant law, um, which of course is, if anyone knows about the San Francisco rent ordinance, it tends to be a colorful practice area. And I earned my chops in courtrooms doing very, you know, small jury trials, but jury trials nonetheless on those, you know, run of the mill landlord tenant cases. Then I moved down to LA actually and practiced in downtown LA for several years, also doing real estate. Um, but because of my geographic location, the cases were more commercially centered, a lot of commercial lease disputes. Um, some residential HOA matters also there. Then I moved back to San Francisco and kind of wanted to end my landlord tenant practice, <laughs> was kind of sick of the five day turnaround personally. So I brought in my practice to HOAs and co ownership disputes, buyer seller disputes, et cetera. So then after that, um, I was finding that I was uh, building out a practice in the North Bay especially wine country. So it just made sense to open up a brick and mortar space. And KDV, the short form for Kaufman, Dulwich, Volick, gave me the opportunity to do that so I could still maintain my San Francisco business and then also expand to the wine country. So I'm, so, while you're... I'm so jealous you're up in Sonoma. <laughs> it's like all the best wineries, right? At your fingertips. <laughs> it is. It can be too tempting sometimes to have too many decadent lunches on work days, so. <laughs> so let me ask you about your current practice. Um, you, you mentioned you do, you do buyer-seller disputes. Are you focused more in commercial or more in residential? More in residential, just because um, I find there's more, I, I don't know if it's just through word of mouth that I've established a reputation over the years that I can help with those matters. I'm also a licensed real estate broker in California. So that helps, I think, with uh, compliance questions and things like that. And and when you when you tell your clients about that, do you think that that gives you more credibility? So you're you are a current licensed real estate broker, correct? Correct. Yes. And I'm quite involved with the San Francisco Association of Realtors and then locally here, the North Bay Association of Realtors. So yes, I, I think I, I often have my finger on the pulse, especially in the wake of the pandemic and all the different changes that have resulted from that, which definitely helps our clients. Okay, well, that, that's good stuff. You know, I want to talk about some things in the past and some things right now, because you know, you, you've got some really great stuff going on uh, and you have going on. So in 2013, you were the Morningstar recipient from the Real Property Law section. So that's really quite an honor. That was just about the time I started getting involved with the Real Property section. So I don't have much memory of that, but I, I do remember that that was an important award. It was taken very seriously and there was a lot of applicants. So it was a real honor to be chosen and you could tell us about that. But I also saw that you have this award and I'm hopefully I'm saying it right because I, I, I wrote it down and I may have been too much of a shorthand. The Minority Bar Coalition Award. And I don't really know much about that. So maybe you could tell us 
a little bit about how did you get these awards? You know, are you out there putting your name, you know, into the hat for all these places? Or are people coming to you and saying, you know, we think you're a great applicant, you should apply. Tell us about that. Um, so addressing each of those one at a time, first the Real Property Morningstar Award, I think I applied, I really don't remember. <laughs> Um, but I, I believe at the time, this was now eight years ago or so, um, I was starting to get more involved with bar associations, including the American Bar Association. At the time, I believe I was very active with the Young Lawyers Division of the ABA. And of course, I brought my real estate practice with me as part of you know, what I do. And um, diversity has always been a, an initiative that's been near and dear to my heart for obvious reasons. Um, I'm a minority myself and practicing in real estate law has really shown me firsthand that it, it's often um, not as diverse as perhaps other practice areas. Mm -hmm. And so it's just been always at the forefront of my mind. And I've always tried to think of ways to create pipelines for young attorneys, how to create more diversity in our practice, especially in the real estate practice area. So I guess that's why they recognize my efforts back in 2013. Well, that's good. And for anybody who wants to read up a little bit more on Jean and to go to the KDV website, um, you'll find that there's information there and there. I noticed in, in the website, there's really a, a, a strong emphasis on the diversity aspect of the law firm. And the law firm has actually received some kind of award. Just tell us what that award is briefly. Sure, it's called Mansfield. Status, I guess, I'm not sure if it's a reward really. Yeah, it's a certification. It's called Mansfield certification and there are various levels 1.0, 2.0 and onward. Uh, currently we're at the 4.0 certification. And what that means is we have met certain metrics of diverse staff and associates alike, attorneys alike at the different levels. Um, I don't know what the percentages are for the 1.0, 2.0 onward, but basically we have reached the percentages for the 4.0 certification. And we are very close, I'm proud to say, of reaching 5.0 certification by the end of this year, if things continue to go with this momentum that we're that we're on. So um, it is in fact one of the main reasons I moved to KDV uh, from a smaller boutique law firm because it really allowed me the platform to focus on these diversity initiatives. Well, personally, I think that's great. I know there's a big diversity initiative for the California Lawyers Association, the real property section. We make every effort to try to be diverse ourselves. Hey, Ashley, do you know, are, are there, are there still, is it still the time to file applications for, I guess, next year's executive committee or is that already passed? I don't remember. Uh, that's a good question. I think it might have passed already. Um, I can double check on that and see. All right. Well, Beth might know she's there she, if she can't find out. So last thing, Jean, um, something that people may not know about you. What can you tell us about you that everyone just wouldn't know just by looking at you, talking to you, reading up about you? Um, I don't think most people know that I'm Canadian by birth. I'm now a dual citizen. So I, I um, have both American and Canadian citizenship, but I grew up there in Toronto, Canada, played a little peewee hockey, you know, all the classic <laughs> things you would imagine about a Canadian. Um, so I, I think that's a little fact that most people wouldn't know. So you're a Maple Leafs fan then? A huge Maple Leafs fan, for better or worse. <laughs> I love some hockey, especially Canadian hockey, let me tell you. <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah, big hockey fan. Yep. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you're going to, I don't know, are you, can you stay with us for the last half hour? I'll stick around. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And it's right thank up your alley, all this stuff. It's real property stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. You, you've been a, a great guest and I, I love your commentary and you're a very interesting person and a high quality person. And I, I appreciate you being our interviewee today. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And you're the litigator in the group here. So Neil and I have no <laughs> knowledge about anything regarding partition actions. <laughs> Happy to share my perspective for sure.
Well, and it so looks now, like now from all that good stuff, let's go into fighting again, right? Neil, it looks like it looks like applications are still open. I think Beth wrote yes, so people oh. still can apply. All right, and again, you know, the we want to you know make sure our section is diverse. That's what the CLA is focusing on, and as long as we get quality people, that's what we're most interested in at the real property section. So let's talk a few minutes about Ring versus Harmon. Okay, so got another case here. Here we go, a mother, Ring, she's 80 years old. And unfortunately um, for Miss Ring, she was left a house with $300,000 in equity in a will when her daughter died. So we're you know, kind of a tragic situation, mother outliving the daughter. So the case was going through probate. The mother is both the representative of the state and a beneficiary. I don't think she was the only beneficiary, but she was a beneficiary of the state. And the house was left to her. So there's probably some other assets in the state. Son number one, and that son's son, the grandson, convince, and maybe depending how you look at the facts, trick the mother grandmother to take out a $200,000 loan against the property at 10.99% interest only with a five-year balloon <laughs> payment with apparently no ability to make the payments, which would mean what? No ability to pay off, possibly no ability to pay off the loan at the end of the five years, which means a good chance that that's home would be foreclosed upon. Um, of that $200,000, 110 was used to pay off the existing loan. You gotta love some of these other facts. 27,000 to pay in advance to son number one on his inheritance from his sister, I suppose. $42,000 that went into an estate bank account. And I believe son number one had a power of attorney for the mother. And so he withdrew all of that money from the bank account. You gotta love these happy families, right? All right, and then of course the rest went to various title fees and escrow fees and the like. Of course, when the mother figures all this out, and I don't know if the mother did or if son number two did, because the mother through son number two filed a claim against the son number one, against the grandson, against the lender, and that's where you get the, the name parties Harmon and the entity TSG for elder abuse, predatory lending, and a bunch of things. Well, a trial, and and the we're only concerned with the appeal with the appeal with the the lender, so Harmon and TSG. They filed a demur to the complaint. They said you've got no right to bring a cause of action for elder abuse. And the trial court granted the demur, right? finding that the claims were only asserted against the mother in her capacity as a personal representative of the estate, but not in her individual or her personal capacity. Therefore, the elder abuse statutes do not apply. The elder abuse statutes apply to individuals, and we'll see in the appellate court decision, you know, or to a representative for the elder, right? And as a representative of the estate, the duty is to the estate, not to the individual beneficiaries of the state. So Ring wound up appealing. Ring claimed to be injured as a beneficiary. Basically, she had an interest in the estate property. Okay, And so she was personally injured by fraudulently being convinced to take out this loan. We talked about normally a personal representative, what their duty is. Remember, a financial abuse claim can only be brought by a representative of the elder in the personal capacity. Okay. The Elder Abuse Act, Welfare and Institutions Code, 15600, et cetera, protects those 65 and older from physical and financial abuse. The appellate court said, well, Ms. Ring did have an interest in the house itself, it was an interest that was basically conditioned upon the probate of the estate. Okay. 
The interest is just one of the many bundle of rights that one has in real property rights. Okay, so the demur was overturned. So interesting here, in this case, right, the trial court sided against the person who was apparently defrauded, right? In our previous case, you can see the trial court said, you know, that wasn't fair what the daughter-in-law did, right? So in the previous case, it was kind of decided on the basis of equity. And you could see that in the previous case, the trial court said, you know, it really was not equitable what the daughter-in-law did, you know, recording the deed six days before filing the divorce, right? Here, the trial court said, hey, we just don't see where the law applies. We have to stick with the law. Ashley, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think the appellate court was trying to uh, find a way to help old grandma, you know, survive or, you know, pr prevail here because she was clearly defrauded. I mean, there was $300,000 in equity in this house that she was entitled to through the probate. And they convinced her to, you know, put a $200,000 loan on it when it only had $100,000, you know, existing at an absur absurd interest rate. I mean, we're dealing with interest rates of three to 4% right now at the highest, and they're doing it at 10.99% on a private loan for five years. Like it's clearly usurious. Um, so yeah, I think I think this was the, the appellate court's way of finding a way for her to be able to recover because there was so much wrongdoing here <laughs> against her interest. And she's and, 80, she doesn't know anything that she's signing, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, she, she may not, not just because she's 80, but just because of the facts of this case, it's apparent. Yes, thank Dean, you. You're off mute. What do you have to say? I am wondering what, why they needed to file the complaint on behalf of Ring as uh, the representative of the estate. And there might have been some strategic reason to do that. Maybe they're trying to get trust fees or remove son one as a beneficiary, and this would be a great excuse to do that. But it seems that they could have avoided this whole issue by just filing the complaint on behalf of Ring as an individual, and they wouldn't even have to reach the issue. But I may not know, there may be something in the background as to why they needed to allege on behalf of the estate. And it but sounds that, like that's just my take. I, you're probably right there. And again, you're the one who has experience, you know, not I. I'm guessing it was just not artfully pled, you know, mm. <laughs> as, as can happen a lot, you know, in cases. They just did not do a great job uh, at that point. There was a separate claim filed in the probate estate, but not for elder abuse. Hmm. Yeah. Because she couldn't, yeah, because right. the case that she filed in her representative capacity, she couldn't have recovered the financial elder abuse under that one. So I think that's why there were two. Maybe. Right. And my thought also was there might be an attorney's fees kicker to it, although the Elder Abuse Act also entitles the wronged party, um, the victim of elder abuse to attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. So that's another curious thing. And you're right, Neil, maybe it wasn't artfully pled, but then the answer would have been they just amend their complaint rather than go through the trouble and cost of an appeal. So I just thought there must be something behind the scenes that propelled them to, to file this on behalf of the estate specifically. And, and as I actually said, there's rights in the elder abuse statute that you cannot get in probate. So there's, there's, multi, there's, a, multiple, there's a multiplier for damages, um, sort, of like a, uh, sort of like a punitive damage you know, ability. Um, right. in and they were given the opportunity to amend their complaint and for whatever reason they chose not to do so. And I, I don't have an answer for that. You know, I, I suppose you're out there in the real world and, and you find that there's all sorts of principals and attorneys and they have various levels of skill and pleading and maybe this is one of those cases. Sure, but I, I think ultimately the outcome helps people understand the broad application of the Elder, Elder Abuse Act. So uh, depending on the side you're on, of course, I think that helps us at least in future cases. And, and that's one of the good things I think about this case, which is we try to point out cases that our listeners might be able to pick up upon in their future. Just want to remind everybody that Ashley mentioned applications are open for our XCOM, Real Property XCOM, until March 1st. 
And I see Beth put into the chat the link to the application form. So thank you very much. Um, somebody's asking, how do you get certification for MCLE credit? This what's up with us is not offered for MCLE credit. So I guess maybe bye Gary, <laughs> if you're not interested anymore. Okay, so let's go on to our last issue for the day. And then Ashley is gonna talk about um, a special event. So this is, just wanna remind everybody the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act was signed into law. It took effect January 1st of this year. It has a special procedure for doing partition actions for what's known as heir property. What's heirs property? Real property held in tenancy in common. Look at that key first point. There's no agreement governing the partition, right? If the parties have an agreement as to how they're gonna sell the property, how they're gonna distribute the assets, how they're gonna dissolve it, whatever it is, then the Heirs Property Act will not apply. But for all those cases where there's no agreement, maybe the property was just, you know, there were decedents of somebody who left the property to them, there's no agreement, could be that the Heirs Property Act applies. One or more co-tenants acquired from a relative. And one of these three things also has to apply. Either 20% or more of the interest in the property are held by relatives are acquired by relatives, or even from at least my reading of it, even if it's less than 20% of the total interest, if 20% of the co-tenants are relatives, and maybe the 20% who are relatives only hold 15% of the property, but if 20% of the co-tenants are relatives, then the Heirs Property Act would apply. And what does it, what does it do? It says, well, Courts have to determine the fair market value of the property through appraisal. A co-tenant that wants the partition, the other co-tenants have the right to buy them out. Why is that? Because the whole purpose of this is to keep basically property in the family. Okay, that's really one of the purposes of the Heirs Property Act, keep property in the family. Maybe none of the other um, co-tenants have the ability or want to buy. The court first has to look at doing a partition in kind, right? Separating the property. Well, that's not so easy to do if what was left to all the children and grandchildren you know, was a single family residence. How are you gonna partition that, that in kind, right? You know, somebody gets one bedroom, somebody gets the bathroom, somebody gets the living room, right? Doesn't really work too well unless great prejudice will result. But look at some of the things the court has to consider in whether there's an exception to partitioning in kind. Okay, well, obviously the value of the whole versus the value split up, whether there's sentimental value to any of the co-tenants. So I thought that was an interesting and whether any of the co-tenants are using the property. If there's a sale, well, you can see the, um, maybe the influence of my employer, the California Association of Realtors in getting this bill through, which is sales shall be through an open market sale through a real estate broker. Okay, for at least the fair market value. And if one of the heirs wants to purchase, they're, they're entitled to a credit. Um, so the real issue is why was, why was this law necessary? Um, and why wouldn't these things, if they're beneficial, why wouldn't they apply to any partition action? And so I'm gonna turn it over to you know, Ashley and Jean. And, you know, what do you think about that? I have, Go ahead. I have so many feelings about this statute. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Um, so to answer your question, Neil, I think, and you, you pointed out in the slide, um, perhaps one of the reasons for the statute is to streamline partitions for at least heirs to real property. Um, so that, that is one, one thing that they accomplished with the statute. What I'm disappointed by, however, is this reference to partition in kind, because it leaves intact what I believe is an antiquated assumption that partition in kind is ever possible anymore in, in the state of California, just given the California subdivision codes and the reality that 
there is very rarely a piece of property that is just plain undeveloped rural land. Um, and certainly for those properties, partition in kind, at least according to the current partition statute, says that partition in kind shall be the first choice. But that is such a small minority of properties these days that this could have been the opportunity for the legislature to say, at least in this air situation, that they'll do the appraisal, determine FMV, fair market value, and then of course allow each of the heirs an opportunity to buy out. But in that last prong, if none of the heirs want to buy out or purchase the property, that it then should go to a partition by sale, or at least some clarity on partition in kind only ever applying to rural property, something like that. So um, that's the only part that I'm disappointed by. Uh, in general, I do like that at least there's a very clear process for partitions involving heirs of real property. There's 30 days to do this, 45 days to do that. And you just now have such clear procedures that we didn't have originally. And you're right, Neil, I, I wish that procedure were spelled out for all other kinds of partitions, but at least we have it for this type of partition. Ashley, it sounded like you wanted to say something earlier, so go ahead. Oh, no, I was telling Dean to take the lead on this one because oh, okay. I, I don't do partitions, but I do draft a lot of tenant and common agreements. So I'd be curious what your thoughts are, Jean, as far as whether this would change anything that we would we should be putting in our tenant and common agreements between family members or how any thoughts on that? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if this materially changes the TIC agreements in general. Presumably those TIC agreements will simply state thou shall not seek a partition or something along those lines. Um, what's tricky, of course, is when heirs inherit property through, say, a distribution of the trust, and then there's that limbo state when either they make no efforts to enter into a TIC agreement, or they're in that in-between state where they have nobody has actually executed, fully executed a TIC agreement. That's where I think this new statute could come into play if a partition were filed. So can, uh, so actually this is a question I just have personally in drafting the TIC agreements. If you include a clause that says, you know, they have to do some sort of buyout procedure before they can go to partition, but do, do we still have to have language that says that they have an unconditional right to a partition as a co-owner of a property, no matter what? Is that, is that true? Um, I don't believe so. My understanding has always been that the right to partition may be waived by okay. contract. Um, statute certainly contemplates that. So um, I think if you're drafting a TIC agreement that spells out a buyout process, that buyout process simply prevails, regardless of what the statute says. Parties could presumably contract around it however they wish. Gotcha. Okay. And I guess the statute then wouldn't even apply because you'd have a written agreement related okay. to the partition. So, okay. Exactly. Well, thank you both so much. Nice to get the opinion of people who are knowledgeable in these things. So let's kind of wrap up our what's up with us. Here's a list of some real property law section activities. And the big one highlighted there in yellow is the wellness retreat. You know, we got about five minutes left, Ashley. Can you squeeze it into five minutes? I'll be fast. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so John Richards, uh, JR, uh, and Elizabeth Blair and I are the three co-chairs of this uh, Health and Wellness Committee for the Real Property Law section. And we're super excited to finally get to plan an in-person event since we had to cancel our spring conference in uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, but this will be a lawyer wellness retreat. So we will have some real property MCLE seminars. We will have some health and wellness based uh, seminars on things like attorney burnout and substance abuse and things like that. So you'll get some specialty ethics credits. Uh, it's going to be in Lake Tahoe, April 22nd to the 24th at the uh, Ritz Carlton. And uh, so it'll be a pretty awesome, very cool venue. And there'll be a lot of fun activities like hiking and a dinner on a, a boat and uh, yoga and some like boot camp type classes. So 
We really hope you guys will want to sign up. Uh, we're going to get that registration live probably in the next uh, week or two on the website. So we'll have early bird pricing and um, hopefully you can all take advantage of that. Oh, that sounds great. I, I can't recall an event at a uh, Ritz Carlton during my tenure with the real property section. So congratulations, Ashley, for getting us to some nice, <laughs> nice locale. Spend if it's going to be a retreat, we want everyone to be excited to go to the hotel. So <laughs> I know I am. If you look at the website, it's beautiful. So. Oh, okay, great. But Oh, for for the, the for the hotel for the hotel, and probably you said within the next maybe two three weeks a month we'll have something up on the real property section website. Hopefully, before the end of this month, we'll have the website up, and we'll definitely be sending out some e blasts uh, about it as well. So, okay, wow, good stuff. Thank you, Ashley. You did that with plenty of time. So we had somebody saying, "Are we going to go till two o'clock? Are we going to end early?" Well, it looks, looks like we're going to end early. Again, anybody, if you have comments, questions, suggestions, and of course, I didn't put a place for anybody to send comments, questions, or suggestions, but I'll just tell you right now, you can just send them to me. My email address is very simple. It's neilk at car.org. So that's N-E-I-L-K at C-A-R dot O-R-G. And I'll share those with Ashley and others at the real property section. If you wanna uh, catch up on our past, what's up with us, you can go to YouTube. There's a uh, California Lawyers Association has a channel on YouTube. And hopefully we'll see some of you next It'll month. Be February 16th, not January 17th. <laughs> I didn't change it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, next month is February, February 16th. Thank you very much, Ashley. Hey, I'm just going to give a shout out. I saw a couple of our real property section members. JR um, was on the line and Norm Chernin was there. So, hey guys, great. Good to see you, Glad. Hope you enjoyed it. And once again, Gene Grove, thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed and for actively participating in the entire What's Up with us. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month, February 16th. Thank you. At one o'clock. See you.